Brennan B says, I'm halfway finished cleaning my disaster of a room. Well, I've got something terrible to admit, people, because at the moment I'm sitting in my room and it isn't clean. If you're interested in this, everyone, here's a really sophisticated book you could read. You could take a look at Carl Jung's last book, which was called Mysterium Conjunctionis, so that it's Latin. Now, the first part of that book is really kind of like a dictionary of symbolism. He wrote it, I think, in his 80s, and I think he was trying to get down as much as he could of what he knew as fast as he could. So the first part is a dictionary of symbolism, and it's very difficult to read unless you've read a lot of his other writing. But the second part of the book, which I think is an absolute work of genius, Jung makes a couple of propositions about higher order moral development, and so I'm going to run through them really quickly and, and describe their symbolism. So he said the first thing that you want to do if you're going to get your act together um, and this is like an extension of the, of the Piagetian notion of, of stages in moral development. He said, you know, you have an intellect um, and you have a, a set of emotions and motivations and you can conceptualize the intellect symbolically as masculine and the emotions and motivations symbolically as feminine. And so the first conjunction which is the bringing together of the masculine and feminine to make a complete being would be the union of the intellect with the emotions and motivations so that you're not fighting your deeper motivations with your thought, you know, that they're all moving in the same direction. And so that would be conjunction number one. And so then that makes you united in terms of your capability for subjective experience. You're all pointing and all of that's pointing in the same direction. And it's one of the things that can make you unstoppable because you're not at war with yourself then. And so the next conjunction, as far as he was concerned, was also expressed symbolically. So now you have the masculine union of intellect, emotion, and motivation. And then you have the body, which you can now conceptualize as feminine. So then you bring those together in a creative union. And so that means that you start to act out what you think and feel, so that there's no paradoxical relationship or, or enacted lie, they call that a performative contradiction, between what you think and feel and what you do. And that's, and so, because part of being on honest is that you act out what you believe right and so that's great so that's the next conjunction and so that makes you integrated in mind and emotion and motivation and in enacted enacted routine and body great so that's another way of bringing yourself together but the third conjunction is the one that's most interesting and it's also the one that's most difficult to understand and that conjunction occurs when you take this unified mind-body continuum, let's say, and you think, well, wait a second, there's an, there's an element of that missing, and that's my experience, my experience of the world that's hypothetically outside of me or that's hypothetically not me. Now, you know, the, your experience of the world outside that's not you is a very strange experience because it isn't self-evident, for example, to me, that my wife is not me. We spend so much time together. She's in my experience so much. We have a joint past and a present and a joint future. The same with my kids and the people who are close to me. It isn't obvious to me that my wife is less valuable to me than I am to me. She's certainly more valuable to me than some arbitrary body part like an arm or a leg, you know, and, and people are perfectly capable of making gestures of physical self-sacrifice in, in order to rescue people that they love. And so just exactly who you are and just exactly who the external world is not clear at all. And so the last conjunction for Jung was the eradication of the distinction between your subjective experience as you and your objective experience as you. Which is to say, for example, that if I'm walking down the street and I encounter someone in trouble, and that trouble calls to me as something that I could conceivably do something about, the fact that that trouble isn't set right in the world is actually, is actually because it's part of my experience, is actually my problem. Now, that doesn't mean that it's my fault, although it might be, it might not be, perhaps it isn't, but it might be. But it's still my responsibility, and it's reasonable to consider the disruption in my experiential field than encountering someone who is in trouble produces as an actual disturbance in my in, in my being and then to act as if it's my responsibility to rectify that disturbance 
Now, the problem, of course, comes in that you don't know how. So if you run across a street alcoholic, for example, in the middle of the day, and they're stumbling wrong blindly, and maybe they're schizophrenic to boot and mumbling terrible things, you know, it's going to disturb you, and it would be good if you could set it right, but you don't know how, so you can't. You have to avoid it. But that doesn't mean that that isn't you, because it's also you. And I think that's why in the story of, of the Buddha, for example, like the Buddha was basically offered when he became enlightened the chance to remain in nirvana, right, as a uniquely enlightened singular individual. And he actually regret, rejected that offer because it was his deepest conviction that it was, it was not possible for one person to be enlightened and to be in a state of nirvana if everyone wasn't in that state at the same time. And so he had to move himself out of that utopian experience of nirvana and come back to the normal world, let's say, and to try to raise the consciousness of people around him because he regarded that as unfinished business that was his personally. And so, now, I don't remember, who was I? Oh, yes, that's all about cleaning your room. Yes, exactly. So, well, the thing is, is that your, your room isn't not you. It's actually you. There's no difference between the chaos that's outside of you in a place that you spend as much time as you spend in your room and the chaos that's internal psychologically. And, you know, one of the things I often do when I'm first dealing with my clients to, as a simple exercise in setting themselves right psychologically is to have them start to clean up their external environment because people know how to do that and there's no difference between that and putting yourself straight psychologically as you know when you do something as serious as starting to clean up your room and so Brendan the other thing I would say is like finish cleaning your room and then see if you can make it beautiful because that's also unbelievably useful man because it teaches you about beauty and so then you can make one room in your house beautiful and then it's organized and together and beautiful and so once you do that with one room, like you're way wiser than you were before, and you've actually accomplished something concrete that's solid and incontrovertible that you can point to that strengthens your character, and then maybe you can do the same thing with your whole house. And then maybe you can do that with the, more with the world around you. And believe me, if you start doing that, you're not going to be sitting around wondering what the meaning of life is because you're going to find it in that. Mm -hmm.